With a new CEO on the way and a lot of questions to be answered given the current state of the Audemars Piguet brand, I figured I wanted to have a sit down chat with Roman uh, to talk about the rise of the brand and also how it's evolved over the last 20 years in his experience. Roman, thank you so much for joining me. Of course, Marco. I mean, you were talking about my favorite brand, so I would definitely want to sit in on this or have a sit down as you called it. Yeah, this is a brand that you're pretty familiar with, the first watch that you ever sold in the business being an AP, right? Autumn RPA, the Royal Oak City of Sales and Stainless Steel Chronograph Limited Edition to a thousand pieces. Sold it to a guy for nine thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars twenty almost one years ago. I, I guess that's kind of hard to forget the first watch you ever sell, right? It, you know, the funny thing is, is the very first sale I made on eBay was not a watch. I had a DuPont lighter clock. I still have one of those. I had like twenty of them. I put it up. I sold that for four hundred and fifty dollars. That was the very first sale. And but my first watch sale was the watch I just mentioned. Nice. Now, of course, back then, you know, going back over 20 years ago at this point, this was a brand that was probably wildly different than what it is today, right? What was the brand sentiment like? What did people think of their watches and how popular was the AP brand back then? So uh, back when I started, the AP brand was like pretty much any other brand out there. It was what we called a 10 over cost watch. Now, what we mean by 10 over cost, of course, is uh, what can I buy that watch from an authorized dealer? Because back then, the business model was very simple. I'm a gray market dealer, maybe one of 20 that are out there on the internet, right? When I say on the internet, we're talking about eBay. We're not even talking about e-commerce yet, right? And, this, and the general consensus was it was a 10 over brand. Uh, 10 over cost, meaning A, if the cost of the brand is 45 back, what's my cost if it's 10 over cost? 30... 10% over cost. 30 something and a half. I forget what it is. 37. 30, 39 and a half. 39 off. But a general yeah. consensus, I could get the brand at 40 off. Yeah. Uh, because uh, the ADs were happy to make their 10% uh, profit on their minus 45 margin. And then we would sell it off usually anywhere from 35 off to 30 off. Sometimes even managed to do 25 off. And again, there were a few exceptions where... You know, let's say you couldn't particularly find this one watch and the dealer wanted 35 off and then we would sell it off at 30 off or 25 off, right? But that was a general consensus. There was really nothing that stood out. It was also the time where bigger was becoming better. When I first, first started, offshores were somewhat laughed at. Pretty much you can pick up any offshore under $10,000 because they were too big. They were too bulky. They were, too, they were just too much. Right? Again, uh, we're talking about uh, an introduction of the offshore for the 20th anniversary of the Royal Oak, so we're talking about 1992, never really took off. Again, big, bulky, very, very niche. Very avant-garde for its very time. Very avant-garde for its time. Yeah. Remember the use of materials and things like the rubber clad and yeah. things of that nature. Carbons was, and all that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Well, carbon came carbon in later. Carbon came in later, but, came but, later. You know, yeah. but the, the general uh, environment was that, A, this is just another brand, much like I could go and order uh, you know, you lose your Arden at 40 off, just much like I could get an IWC or anything of that nature. That was the general atmosphere for AP at the time, but we were going into times where it was the limited edition offshores that started to propel the brand a little bit higher, which came a couple of years later. So over the last 20 years, obviously the brand has you know, witness a, a tremendous reversal, right? Now it's, you know, top top seven in, in the entire watch industry, a billion dollar company, and certainly worth, I would say, well over a billion dollars today. What do you think was really that turning point for the brand that really allowed it to kind of propel itself into the mainstream and, and break that niche of being just another 10 over cost brand? It's not the what, it's the who, right? And the who obviously is Francois. At the time, Francois was this, uh, came on as the CEO of Americas, right? which means he was in charge of North and South America. Right? It was a man with a vision. It was a man uh, that was ingenious in so many ways. And one of the things that he's done is, for example, he introduced the United States of America to the world of grand complications. Up until that time, the United States of America was a Rolex country. Right? Uh, a gold Rolex was it. Of course, all the other brands were slowly but surely starting to pick up steam with the help of the internet. People were introducing them more and more and more. They started to open their eyes. For the most part, it was a gold Rolex. It was a stainless steel Rolex, right? Bringing into this country uh, a watch like a Grand Complications and making somebody understand the value in a watch based on its complications. Now, I'm not saying there weren't people in the United States that didn't understand complications from brands like Paddock or Vacheron, et cetera, et cetera. Of course there were, but there were such a tiny little percentage. Again, most others went for a look rather than horology. 
And I think Francois did it best with his uh, grand complications that he shocked the world with retail tag prices of six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars. All of a sudden, people are saying, "Well, why am I paying this much for this watch?" Well, this is a perpetual calendar, minute repeater, split second chronograph automatic. This is what you're paying for. Yeah. These are the turbions. No other brand at the time had as many grand complications in their lineup as Audemars Piquet did. What did he really do? He went back to the basics. This is what AP started for. This is the bread and butter of AP, right? Their history starts with making highly complicated movements for the likes of Tiffany and Co. with their pocket watches, right? So it started with the man. Yeah. And then trends did help. And where the trends went was bigger and better. We're talking about fast forwarding a few years where Panerai became excessively popular, a very large watch, where um, IWC Hublot, is Hublot started right coming around. Big one, yeah. Hublot started coming around. The Hublot Big Bangs were extremely, extremely popular. Yeah. They still are contrary to all belief. Uh, you're talking about Big Breitling Avengers. You're talking about and IWC, then AMGs, if you look, all those kind of exactly. Yeah. IWC, AMG, bigger was better, and everybody jumped on a bandwagon. However, if you look at the lineup, when you're talking about high end, AP was the only major brand out there that had something bigger and actually better and actually more of an upper echelon or more expensive for the lack of word brand. Yeah. And that's when you started seeing offshore slowly but surely taking off. And then there was another individual in the industry, specifically the gray market industry, that uh, woke up one day and said, wait a minute, I'm not a big time dealer. I don't have a whole lot of money. I'm still kind of working. I just fit, left my basement and opened up my first office. And he said to himself, there is a way to create a market on something like this. And where he recognized there may be value in a market that could potentially grow into a collectible market, and that was the limited edition offshores. Of course, the individual I'm talking about is me. I didn't have a whole lot of money. I took a chance of buying my first watch at retail, and that was the Audemars Piguet offshore Juan Pablo Montoya. They made a trilogy of them, titanium rose mm -hmm. and uh, platinum. The Rose Montoya still happens to be my favorite offshore. Aesthetically, I think it's just a beautiful watch. Yeah, that obviously, carbon bezel is just awesome. Obviously yeah. has to do, and again, think about the material use yeah, for the time absolutely. and the size and so yeah. on and so forth. And I can talk about the design of the Montoya for a long time, but that's not what this is about. I, at the t they came out of the gate and the first retail was actually 14.7. Then it, I think it quickly jumped up to 17.8. So I bought one for 14.7, then I bought one for 17.8. And I sold it, sold it quickly over list. Then I bought one for 20 and 21 and 22. And as time has gone by, that watch has reached its peak at about 35 to $40,000, which is 2X its retail price. There was nothing out in the market selling a 2X at the time. Yeah. Daytona was not even reaching 2X at the time, right? Yeah, it was over list, but it wasn't reaching 2X. So, uh, which for context for the viewers, the Daytona has been probably the most popular selling watch for the last, you would say, 40 years or so? It still is. Yeah. It still is. It's still the only watch that will forever trade over list, although Rolex has caught up with some of the other models, like Skydweller, yeah. among many other things, due to the late, latest craze we had. But the but, point being, like, the offshore, for, for, that, for the offshore to achieve that was, I mean, groundbreaking for the exactly. time. Exactly. Now you uh, went into a scenario where those with money, right, those that wanted to sh uh, say, okay, well, I have money, and, but I don't want to wear a big bulky Panerai because at the end of the day, the average tax price on Panerai at the time was still under $10,000, right? Mm -hmm. They were still sell they were selling over list, yeah. you know, in this for the first couple of years until they overdid it a little bit. And what ended up happening is, well, what are my options? I want to spend $50,000. I want to spend $60,000. I want to spend $100,000 on a big watch that's in style. When you went to Paddock, your only option was, your biggest option at the time was a 5102, which is the Celestial, or a 5070. Yeah, 5070. Obviously, there's the Sky Moon Turbion, but that's a little yeah, bit of a different price. But we're range. talking, even on a 5070, exactly. a completely different exactly. price bracket. When right? you went to a Vacheron, all they had was the Overseas, which at the time was 40 millimeters. Yeah. That was no longer, that was already small. Even at the time, this is when Breguet stepped out of their comfort zone and made the Breguet Marine Chrono, if you remember those. Yeah. But again, those were still only 40 millimeters. Yeah. So for somebody that wanted to get out there and spend a significant amount of money, what they tended to go for is gold offshores. A gold brick, the original yellow gold brick, which again, from a regular production line, I think nothing beats an old school yellow gold brick, either with the champagne dial or the blue dial. It's just, it's just, and you feel it, it's a brick. And then you obviously went to the rose gold rubber clad, which at the time they were trading for, oh, I'm going to say mid 20s, mid to high 20s, right? And uh, and then of course you had the limited editions, especially when you start talking about things like platinum. 
subsequent limited edition offshores, such as the Grand Prix. One time, the Platinum Grand Prix was trading at $135,000. The Platinum Barrichellos, when the Barrichellos came out, they did it even better than that of the Montoya. It was a question of which direction Francois took the brand in terms of what he was introducing. This whole limited edition thing, he did it in such a way, he brought in such celebrities or ambassadors uh, especially utilizing people from the racing world, Juan Pablo Montoya, Barrichello. Though. Not to mention also, I would say, he was very good at using the social media of the day, which was public figures, right? Jay-Z, the likes of... Well, of course. Yeah, the likes of Shaquille O'Neal, LeBron James. You ever see the original Jay-Z limited edition that he made? Oh, my God. It comes in a box this big. It came with an iPod. iPod, yeah. IPod. I think that iPod is worth more money yeah. today uh, with his signature in the back. I mean, uh, and then he also went geographical, if you remember, right? Because... Pretty much 99% of all limited edition offshores went over list in the secondary market due to a couple of things. Number one, design. Number two, as you said, the social media of the day utilizing the proper figures. Nobody in the snooty watch world would ever even consider using a, guy, a hip hop star for their limited edition. Guess what? He did extremely well. And he knew exactly how many pieces to make. He didn't make a thousand uh, uh, Jay Z's and steel, a 500 in rose and 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 yeah. uh, 100 in platinum. There's only 10 in platinum. There's only 50. Or I think a hundred. It was 10 platinum, 50 in rose or 100 in rose and and or, or 50 in rose and I think 100 in steel. Right? Then the geographical. He said, "Wait a minute. We have points of sales around the world. I'm going to drive traffic to my points of sale by creating limited editions for those boutiques. You had the New York boutique Royal Oaks. You had." Ginza, you had Taipei 101, you had for Amsterdam, it was the uh, Amsterdam Diamond, Diamond District, District Diamond yeah. District watch. Uh, what else? Uh, you had the uh, Rue, you probably say, but Saint Honoré. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, you had the Saint Honoré, and, and then you, he also got into the world of F1 yeah. as well, which at the time wasn't really that popular of a sport, but certainly, you know, the Singapore Grand Prix watch was a humongous hit in Asia. People loved it, even though. Most people wouldn't be caught dead in Asia wearing such a humongous watch at the time. So very avant-garde, very first. And that's what I think made the brand successful. And in addition to that, you're also looking at avant-garde use of materials, which translates to this very day. Yeah. I think all those factors are so important to point on. And one thing that he probably doesn't get enough credit for, and you could probably speak on more than myself, is him going cutting out the ADs and going boutique only. Well, I was going to get to that, but we're so, talking about a later time. Yeah, so let's that, talk about materials first, yeah. right? Innovative use of materials, obviously, I think AP is really the pioneers, right? You go back to, I would say, really the, the one that started it all would be the concept line, right? The the, the first concept, you know, with, with uh, what, what was Alicrite. it? Alicrite, right? The, the Alicrite, something that we'd never seen before, something that was used in, in you know, aerospace, right? Like, what's that belong in a watch for? And then they went on to create carbon concepts and so on. You didn't really see that from Richard Mill. You can even start that earlier. Yeah. How about, how about starting with a rubber strap? Yeah. Which is a caoutchouc strap, which yeah. is a special type of That's rubber. True. It comes from South America. Let's start there. And the use of a rubber clad bezel, i.e. the same material. That's true. Then we move into things like, uh, then forget carbon for a second. How about PVD? Let's yeah. start with the end of days. My one of my favorite limited editions in two thousand one. Original retail price on that watch was ninety seven hundred dollars. Side story: There was a guy in, uh, named John in um, Chicago that realized the same thing I realized as a dealer, but as a private client, he started buying up all the end of days. The end of days went from trading at twelve thousand dollars to almost sixty thousand dollars in a matter of six months because he bought like forty of them. Wow. Right? I know I personally sold them at least thirty. Right? And it's funny because every, the, the very next watch I was selling, I was already paying the same or more than or what I sold them the last one for. But you got PVD. Then you move into things like carbon, right? And not just any carbon. You're talking about carbon inlays on a bezel. But then we move on to full carbon watches like the trio of the Team Alinghi's, right? The all carbon Team Alinghi. A bit of a flop on the bezel side of things because it would get banged yeah. up. And, uh, but then that carbon material translated to other additions. Right, where it was partially carbon. Then we get into ceramics, the ceramic bezel. We get into so many innovative use of materials, and guess what? The entire industry followed suit. Yeah, you know, and it's it's just it's just become amazing to see the entire industry pick up. And how about diamond pieces? I mean, he made some of the most ridiculous diamond pieces. I had a full blown baguette studded Audemars Piguet Royal Oak offshore, both men's and ladies' version. It was literally one big piece of diamond on a wrist. It was insane. Yeah, and still to this day, I mean, they make the skeleton double balance and full, you know, with the full bust down. 
Uh, obviously, that's factory. They just released a skeleton open work with the, the kind of pointers on the bracelet and the baguette bezel, which how is about the another set, crazy How about one. the set that you just made yeah, from that, the various that ruby so orange, yeah, yeah. $10 million. And they're not afraid to price it high. They charge for what they make. They only made two of those sets, of course, yeah. and if anybody wants to buy, would probably have to pay more than $10 million today. But look, innovative use of material has been uh, an amazing, amazing thing by AP, and mind you, all while staying true to their roots. Yeah. As Adrian says, they took the greatest blank canvas out there, either Royal Oak, the gent that created back in 1972, and it hasn't changed. Yeah, it really hasn't changed. I mean, it, the fact that they've been able to use that watch and expand their model line from the Royal Oak to the offshore, to the offshore diver, to the concept, it, I mean, even to the Code 1159, which has the Royal Oak mid-case, I think it's nothing short of genius on, on AP's part, right? And I mean, even sticking by the roots, they've shown that they love and appreciate watchmaking still, right? Because in that blank canvas, they could have just sucked by their laurels, but they made probably every complication under the sun. And in fact, probably pushed the boundaries of what can be done. And then they, they kept doing it uh, and show that they, they wanted to continue to push the boundaries by acquiring Renault and Poppy, right? Which is, again, we've talked about them, you know, I mean, listen, so many Renault, times. From that, what was born the concept line yeah. or the Alacrite concept, yeah. from that also Richard Mill was born, yeah. if you remember, because they use the same movements in their 002, 03. And even AP owns a stake in Richard Mill, the, the company, right? Yeah. Just because they understood what, what was happening with the brand. Well, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to the time where uh, Francois became the global CEO, yeah. and that's when the world started looking at me like he's a madman, and s most people actually laughed at him when he said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna cut out the AD slowly but surely. I'm gonna go boutique only route. I'll just open up a bunch of points of sales for Audemars Piguet. Yeah, and what was that, if I may ask, what was the sentiment when he first did that? Did people say, this people guy's laughed, absolute... People laughed at him. And wh why was that? Because back then- I will explain to you. I'll, yeah. give, you, I'll, give, you, the, I'll give you the break, the, what is it, the break of the land or the break yeah, out of the, the land? Break down, uh, the breakdown. down. The breakout of the land at the time. It was a very simple thing. You had the internet pretty much uh, working directly with ADs. Sure. You also had some internet guys that were buying some things, some clothes out, some things that directly from some of the manufacturers. We were one of those guys. And you basically had a simple formula. You, you have a website, you put up a catalog of every watch out there, right? Literally every single model. You get an inquiry, you call a dozen of the ADs that you know, say, hey, do you have this in stock? Yes, I do. You already know my cost is 10 over cost. Yeah. Boom. So essentially a brand couldn't sell a watch without an AD. That was, that was the idea? You, you had brands that had sort of flagship boutiques here and there. You did have brands that had these boutiques, but they were extremely scary. It was the world that was ruled by the ADs. Right. The AD was the centralized ruler of this entire watch universe. And this was still at a time when AP was not selling over MSRP, right? Because this no, was when we were no. talking about mid this is, a, this is at the time where limited edition offshores were, a few choice pieces were, but for the most part, you had, you had uh, every, pretty much every brand that is on selling on their list, yeah. on a secondary or at list at AD or boutiques. But it was also the time where you could walk into an AD and get a discount. Yep. You know, the same AD that would sell me something at 10 over cost, with, uh, which is let's say 40 off, with you walk into a boutique, if you try hard enough, you ask for 30 to 35 off, you would get it if to see just how badly they want to come sure. off the watch, right? So Francois says, I'm gonna cut out, I'm gonna start opening up boutiques. And everybody knew, just like what Rolex did by Brian Booker, everybody knew that, hey, this was his way to slowly cutting out the middleman. And I think in the back of Francois's head, and I can't you know, attest to that, because he hasn't personally told me that, but if I'm him, I'm thinking in the back of my head, here I am, 150 some year old company, and our life is literally being controlled by our middleman. A guy whom I simply give this product, and they're controlling the market. That is not wrong. That is not right. It should be the manufacturer, the guy that makes these watches to control that product. He opens up the boutiques, everybody laughs. Why? Because they're like, well, who the hell is gonna go into that boutique, buy something at list, when I can go to my local AD, get a discount, or further, I can just go on luxurybazaar.com and get this thing at 30 off. Yeah. Why am I going to buy from the boutique? Well, as Francois started tightening up the noose, Cutting lines, cutting lines, cutting lines, and you saw a majority of those dealers starting to lose their lines. This is when the blue dial became popular. Because, and I don't think it was even true, but the idea became that anything that's a blue dial is now a boutique-only version. And all of a sudden, you can only get that a boutique at list. 
And slowly but surely, also, we evolved from the offshore times into the Royal Oak times, Royal times. because bigger and better was over. We started to scale down. What did that translate to? Down to the Royal Oak line. Very familiar to the offshore, same watch, right? Yeah. And that's when you started saying, well, wait a minute, I don't really have a whole lot of options. That's when guys like me were saying, oh, wait, I can no longer call any AD. Because my system at the time, so you understand before that, it was automated. Like I would get an inquiry for, let's say, this particular Royal Oak. There would be an automated message, email, that would go out to over 40 authorized dealers asking, hey, what's my price? Do you have this watch? Right? Slowly but surely, that dealer pool went to zero. Now what do I do? Now we're talking brand new watches. Now what do I do? Because pre-owned wasn't that strong then. Yeah. Now what do I do? Oh, I don't really have a choice. And then it only took enough time for guys like us to realize, well, you know what? I'm going to try to start buying this stuff at the boutiques and selling it over list. And this is how it went into the era that you've, we found ourselves basically today. And right pre-COVID, that fueled it to the extremest levels I have ever seen. And mind you, we had a crisis in between, a big financial crisis in between in 2008. So things yeah. have calmed down and they've then built back up. It has gotten to a point where those that laughed at him and now have zero choice but to agree with me and say, you know what, that was a genius move. And there's solid proof of that. They say the proof is in the pudding. Every other brand has since followed suit. And now we're seeing the same thing from somebody we would never expect it from, which is Rolex. Yeah. Now, obviously, Francois, I think, has been probably the most important person in AP to, to essentially lead them. But he's not been without controversy, right? Obviously, the AP brand today, you know, when it comes to getting an allocation for a watch, it's probably more difficult than ever before. And he's leaving at a time when you would say probably the AP brand is in the most turmoil it's witnessed, probably, I would say, since 2015, let's say, when they really decided to go the, the boutique route, right? Now, my, my question to you is, first of all, what do you think about you know, him stepping down and a new CEO incoming? But, but most importantly, do you think kind of AP's reputation because of this new system over the last you know, three to five years has really, is, is going to leave an impact on, on the brand itself? I don't think it's going to leave an impact on a brand. I think what has transpired in the last three, four years, in three, four years you know, COVID time, hype types, and now the last year where things have sort of come down. And again, when I say come down, come down what, to 2X, 1.5X, yeah. right, of over retail? I, don't, I think it's the industry overall that has left an impact on individuals in the watch industry. But I'll tell you this, and I'm going to go out on a limb. The true real watch collectors out there, it did not leave an impact on them, and I'll tell you why. The reason it didn't leave any, an impact on it because they were in it for the love of the watches, for the love of the hobby. It left an impact on those that went in there for the sole purpose, or the number one purpose, is the fact that these have now become investments in commodities. Those are the ones that these things would leave a bad taste in their mouth. The ones that are true collectors, the ones that understand that things go up, things go down, and don't really care. The people that didn't care that when they, the Royal Oak they paid 50 grand for went up to 125 and that's back down to 75, they don't care. It doesn't leave an impact on them. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah, and, absolutely. And if, if, if at any given time they want to get rid of their watch and trade it up for something else, it's irrelevant to them whether they do it at a high market or a low market. I had a conversation with a client just yesterday who was purchasing a watch that at a, he purchased a watch from us in a high market for $100,000. That watch is now worth sixty. dollars He also was looking to buy a watch which at a high market was $200,000. It's now a hundred. And I told him, I said, Yes, I understand yeah. that in the back of your head you're losing forty grand, but in reality, does it really matter? Yeah, it makes up in the exactly. sense that yeah, you it, know what I mean. It's works. it's whatever you're going to sell today and get a lower price, you're going to get the next thing for a lower right. price. If you're cashing out, sucks to be you, as they say. You want to buy when it's down and sell when it's high, right? But yeah. let's, if the things were to go back to normal, if you want an AP, you still don't have a choice but to go into a boutique and pay retail. So if the sales tend to go down, availability will go up in the boutiques. But they're not stupid, because what they're going to do is they're going to look at production numbers. Think about how much AP's production has increased in the last 10 years. At the time I was in the industry, I think they were making under $20,000 watches a year. Yeah. Today they're at 60, 65. Yeah. That's a big difference. Or they're, they're going to 60,000. They're going to 60,000. Yeah. That's a big difference. That's right? a huge jump. Exactly. But when you got a waiting list that's three years long, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Now, if I were to ask you, right, obviously Francois is now leaving, stepping down as CEO, a new CEO is coming. What do you expect from this CEO? Do you think it's going to be a lot of Francois' vision, or do you think maybe she's going to come in and try to shake things up? 
It's very difficult to say. Now, you know, uh, the new CEO, it's a privately owned company still. Yeah. Right? The bits and pieces of it are owned by others, but it's still a privately owned company. Yeah. For and not to mention, you know, the next three years, it's still going to be Francois' vision that is just being carried out kind of thing, right? I think that if I'm the new CEO of Automark Big I'm walking in and I'm shitting my pants saying I have big shoes to fill. Yeah. Because, you know, people always ask me, why do you think Francois is leaving? Well, I think because he's leaving like Michael Jordan would leave. <laughs> he's leaving at the very, very top, right? Hopefully it's, he doesn't it, come back with a second stint in the Wizard. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's, it's, it's a, a, <laughs> watch, him, watch him come back to IWC or something. Yeah. And, no, uh, I think that Francois did for the brand. I think after Edward Piguet and Jules Audemars, he's the third most important com Probably. person in that company. Yeah throughout the whole time, right? Sure. So he left at the top, he dropped his mic and said, hey, look what I did. And the new CEO, if I was the new CEO, I would probably study all the events that me and you just discussed, well up, led up to the success. I would look forward to the market and see how to continually uh, move on with this. It's very, very difficult to take, because let's face it, Autumn RPGA's success is in the Royal Oak line, Royal Oak, Royal Oak Offshore, Royal Oak Concept, right? Yeah. Majority of their success. How can you continuously continue with the scene that all these brands have while you technically making the same thing over and over, just packaging it different? How do you continue to innovate horologically? How do you continue to innovate in terms of design and material use? How do you continue bringing on the type of ambassadors that are not like every other brand yeah i mean that that, that was going to be my next question right like i want them to get into f1 if, pick up an f1 sponsorship please <laughs> no, mercedes i don't please, think so please I, I don't think that's a good i don't think that they need it that's the thing right a, a brand like ap does it probably doesn't need a sponsorship like that even though it would be great but that that was my next question i want right? my mercedes shirts to have the ap sign on them not iwc i love iwc don't yeah, get me but wrong that's, <laughs> fair fair enough uh that was going to be my next question, right? My next question being, what would you like to see from the AP brand? I'm with you, right? I would love to see them go back to their roots, continue to innovate on materials. But they do. But, but they do. Uh, of course. That's, that's what they, but it feels like they're kind of resting more so on their laurels than ever. But you're seeing a changing of the guard with the new, if you saw the, the remember we discussed the, the code grand complication. Uh, you see what they're doing with the code 1159 line, it being kind of their new blank canvas to show off uh, their watchmaking. I'd also love to see AP come out with something to compete against the Royal Oak. I don't think it will ever cannibalize the Royal Oak in the sense that they have the Royal Oak, they have the offshore, they, that's, that's been a major success, it's gonna be continuing to be a major success, right? But if you look at and, and compare that to Patek, right? Patek has the Nautilus and they have the Aquanaut. In the same way that AP has the Royal Oak and the Royal Oak offshore, I'd love to see them have something different. Like, create something new, you know let's, what I mean? Let's go to AP, outside of uh, some various things that they've made for a short amount of time, some special pieces. You had your Jules Audemars, you had your Millinery, you had your Edward P.A., and you had your Royal Oak and Royal Oak offshore lines, right? Yeah. Uh, let's just, let's just uh, put it on the, the Royal Oak umbrella, because whether it's offshore yeah. or concept, concept doesn't whatever. matter, it's still Royal Oak, right? What, you, what, what the new CEO could potentially do is go out into the new world and pick up some of these up and coming independent watchmakers, right? and allow them the expressive freedom to design specific watches, to design specific avant-garde movements or something in horology that hasn't existed before, right? But would that make sense for a classical brand to do that? Well, here's the thing, you want something different. Yeah. If you think about a watch, right, how much more different could a watch, if we're gonna talk about shape, it's, no, it's round, true. it's tonneau shape, it's a square shape, yeah. it's a rectangular shape, right? It's hard to reinvent the wheel. It's hard to reinvent a shape, yeah. right? The only other brands out there that go outside of that box is you got guys like MBNF, you got guys like Erwerk, and a few others, right? Yeah. So if you want them to reinvent the line, first of all, if you go too avant-garde, it's not a line that people will wear because too avant-garde is a niche market, i.e. less customers, right? So where do you really innovate? You can't change the Royal Oak because the Royal Oak is an evergreen design that will be here forever and ever and ever. It's a, it's a timeless design, as they call it, right? A Jules line, well, the Code 1159 is sort of a revamp of the Jules line because the Jules line was their round watches, right? Yeah. Yes, they did the Royal Oak mid case, which is somewhat prominent, I guess you could say. But how do you basically invent the ketchup packet today? Right? A ketchup packet is it. When I tell you ketchup packet, you can't think of anything but the picture what it looks like. Right? Yeah. And when you say Audemars Piguet, the first thing you're ever going to think about is Royal Oak. So I don't think there's room for them to come up with a new line. Could they revamp the 
Edward Piguet line, possibly. Uh, Audemars Piguet didn't have any tonneau shaped watches, in the likes of Frank Muller or uh, in the likes of Richard Mille. Could they go that route? Possibility. The question is, how well will the public take? The minute you go outside of the norm, let's talk about Frank Miller. Remember Frank Miller was famous for his 10 shade watches. The minute he made round watches or square watches like the King Cortez, nobody cared. Yeah. Nobody wanted them, right? Richard Mille, how well do round Richard Mille sell? Even the square ones, or, or the rectangular or, or, or ones. Or the rectangular yeah. ones. How well do they really sell? They don't, Yeah. right? Which is why they were closed out but before the whole hype situation. Sure. So when you say come up with a new line, it says easier said than I say, the new CEO sticks to the same thing that Francois has done. He was successful in innovation, in terms of design, in terms of horology, in terms of use of materials, and in terms of the ambassadors that he's brought on. And if you continue going that route, yes, you're going to have your Royal Oak lines, Royal Oak, Royal Oak offshore, and everything else is going to sell like hotcakes, and the rest of the stuff is just going to kind of lag along. You will never have a line that will be the line of the Royal Oak with an Aramar Piguet. It can't happen. Just like you will never have a watch in a Rolex lineup that's going to be more popular than the Daytona. Not going to happen. Fair enough. Roman, I want to thank you so much for joining me. I mean, I learned a lot. I hope you guys did also. Uh, if you have any questions, please do leave them in the comments below. I think uh, you have a wealth of knowledge. I'm glad that we got to share so with the audience. You're talking about my favorite brand. Yeah. I, mean, I can talk about it for hours. No doubt about it. Guys, thank you so much for joining. Please be sure to like the video, subscribe for more in the future. Roman, as always, thank you so much for joining. And next time, wear an AP if we're going to talk about AP. Yeah, fair enough. That's, <laughs> that's a good one. Take care. Take care, guys.